So welcome um, to our third uh, Lent course talk. Um, as you know, hopefully um, we are talking about uh, truth in the public arena. And we've had um, truth in science with um, Professor Rob from Oxford. And last week we had a journalist, Elsa, speaking about truth in the media. And this week we come to truth in um, the arts and in particular truth in literature. And um, we have Luke Kennard speaking. Um, Luke, I've known for a long time. Um, we, we lived together while we were working on PhDs, um, as I think I mentioned last week. Um, and uh, Luke finished his uh, PhD um, on the prose poem, um, I believe, and, um, and uh, has gone on from there to get a, a job, which is extremely well done to him uh, in academia uh, at the University of Birmingham, where he's been for, gosh, I, I suppose about 10 years. Um, and, um, and at the same time, in all that time, he's been publishing poetry, and then in the last, oh goodness, you can correct me on this, but the last probably four or five years has been working on novels and uh, is just about to release his second novel. And um, he's going to speak to us tonight, as I said, on truth and literature. Um, so um, just to say, um, if you can keep yourselves on mute, it makes Zoom work a lot better. Um, I am recording this just so that people um, who aren't able to be here tonight can catch up later. Um, and if through the talk and afterwards, if you can put any questions you have, and there should be plenty of time for questions um, in the chat, um, then it means that either I can read them out or I can ask you to unmute yourself and ask your question. Um, and that'd be great. Um, hopefully we'll get a good conversation afterwards because I always think that's where you get the sort of the most interesting elements of these talks out when you put people on the spot a little bit. Um, so with that, um, and it's up to you, Luke, whether you say something about yourself and where you are um, and what you're doing, um, or if you want to go straight in, then please, please do. Okay, thank you, Luke. Just unmuting myself. Hey. Um, I'm in I'm in Birmingham, um, but that's that's really about all I think <laughs> that is that is going on at the moment. So I'll, just, I'll kind of just launch into it. I think um, I've got some notes which I will do my best not to just read anxiously from. I'll try and just talk around the the notes and the quotations that I've got down here, and I'll 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 share screen at a couple of points. There are a couple of poems that that I'll read out during the during the talk which I always think it's nice to um particularly because I tend to read poems rather too fast as well so I always think it's quite nice to have them on screen so that you can read along or read at your own pace while I rattle through them but I'll, I'll, I'll attempt to slow down when I'm doing so um and just yeah just to thank Brutus so much for inviting me to give this talk and thank you all for coming as well it's really really nice to see so many people and yeah look forward to chatting afterwards too. The concept of truth in, in something as porous and malleable as, as writing, as, as poetry, as fiction, is a complicated one. And, and I could give a really terrible and lazy talk that I've just made out of quotations that I've pulled off Goodreads or wiki quotes, um, every writer has said something about truth, often quite contradictory things. But one quotation that I've always really liked is from the American novelist Eudora Welty, who, when asked about literature and nationality and the extent to which her novels and short stories captured the spirit of the, the southern states of the, of the US, says, that art is never the voice of a country. It's a much more precious thing, the voice of the individual doing its best to speak and to speak not comfort of any sort, but truth. And the art that speaks it most unmistakably, most directly, most variously and most fully is fiction. I quite like that definition of fiction as opposed to as opposed to non-fiction something where we have some kind of pressure and duty towards 
the truth or to plausibility or accuracy in some way, whether that's to do with emotions or the intellect or things that have happened to us or whatever. When I, when I work with writing students, and that is my, my day job, I, I lecture creative writing at the University of Birmingham. I work with students of a variety of ages. Often when I'm working with first year writing students, the draft stories that they hand in in the, in the autumn term in their first years are often kind of similar and, and often they'll be extremely melodramatic and full of horrible things happening. Usually there will be um, maybe a, a botched drug deal, almost definitely a murder. Somebody will probably get shot. There's a lot of blood and a lot of descriptions of blood. Um, and also tears. There are quite a lot of tears in the stories and, and some very florid descriptions of those tears. Sometimes a really detailed description of a single tear rolling down a character's face, perhaps in reaction to the horrific violence that has just been described in the, in the previous paragraph. And the reason that I tend to discourage this in the feedback that I give, which I usually try to make as gentle and encouraging as possible, isn't out of prudishness or distaste for the material or for the depiction of violence. It's, it's more because it's not true. It's this kind of weird simulation of the world that's actually closer to a, a video game or a thriller than it is to reality. It's something that seems to me both sentimental and brutal and that doesn't really contain any humanity within it. So there's this misconception, I think, that you have to create conflict and drama in the things that you write, and that that means, therefore, horrible things have to happen and have to be graphically described, and that's the only way that you can make an impact on a reader. That's the only way you can get our attention. But what really happens is that it asks us, as a reader, to care about these rather flat characters and the situation they're in, purely because it's extreme and because maybe a character died horribly who we didn't even particularly get to know before they did and because somebody else cried about it. We don't have to write what we know, but we do have to write in order to understand. And in that sense, we have a kind of obligation to that which is the case and to a kind of emotional accuracy. I'll, I'll, I'll quite often talk to them about how we're really quite fragile as human beings and often witnessing a fairly minor upsetting event can be quite traumatizing, let alone the material that they've attempted to do justice to in the story. To paraphrase another American novelist, Tom Wolfe, the problem with fiction is it has to be plausible and that may not be true with non-fiction. Non -fiction, can be something that happened, even if it's completely implausible, it doesn't quite have the same duty in a way. And like I said, I'll try to put this as politely and sensitively as possible when I'm giving any kind of critique on something that somebody's written. The main thing I think in the job is to create a space for people to write and to explore ideas and to not be put down for it or discouraged from trying again. But sometimes when I criticize that kind of extreme and violent material, it leads the student to the question, in that case, what do I write about? What should I be writing about if I can't write about this? And that's a really good question. And to stay with the example of, of drug dealers and violent murder, the lives of most drug dealers most of the time are crushingly mundane. And this is something interesting. This is something that is illuminating. And we shouldn't be surprised that the business structures of drug traffickers mirrors that of bureaucracy. In fact, organized crime created bureaucracy to a certain extent. There are very few business practices which didn't first undergo rigorous research and development in the world of organized crime. The reason a show like The Sopranos is so good is not because of the mafia related violence, but because it focuses bravely and unstintingly on the terrible regularness of life. For the most part, the stunted, spiritually inert lives of its characters. That's the way that a show like that gives us the truth, punctuated by moments of horror, but mostly quite dull and quite empty, deliberately so. And my advice to my first year writing students is initially that they should write something boring. A character is trying to buy 
a Valentine's card for somebody that they love, but all of the cards in the shop are tacky and kind of crass, and they can't find one that feels at all appropriate or sums up the way that they're feeling. Um, and then they get stuck trying to cross the road once they leave the shop, having failed to buy a card. If you write that well, you can make that urgent and engaging and human and full of more conflict than if you're trying to write this terrible scene of a murder or a crime being committed. Truth is never boring, even when it takes boredom as its subject matter. It's thrilling, for instance, to read Fernando de Pessoa meticulously describing his own boredom over many years of his life in the Book of Disquiet, and it's thrilling not least because it's unusually and dangerously honest. Every page of the Book of Disquiet is, is quotable. I'll just read a tiny passage um, that I particularly like. The feelings that hurt most, this is Pessoa, the emotions that sting most are those that are absurd. The longing for impossible things precisely because they are impossible. Nostalgia for what never was, the desire for what could have been, regret over not being someone else, dissatisfaction with the world's existence. All these half tones of the soul's consciousness create in us a painful landscape, an eternal sunset of what we are. The American writer John Berryman was a great poet and also a chaotic womanizing alcoholic who had affairs with most of his colleagues and all their partners. He was not somebody who particularly told the truth very often in his life, nor in fact in his poetry, which is full of raucous and contradictory voices. But through that chaos and complexity in his writing, he often gives us a kind of truth. He talks to us with no agenda, with nothing to sell, or convince us of. One of my favourite um, Berryman poems is from his book, The, um, the Dream Songs. I'll just share my screen and try and zoom in on it a little bit. Um, this is poem number 14 from that collection from the early 60s. All of the poems in The Dream Songs are um, the same length of these three, three stanza of six lines each, all of these 18 line poems. And there's me are there. It's 77 in the first book, and then he wrote a hundred more over, over several years. This is number 14, which is my favourite, and, and pertains to boredom in some way. Is the text kind of, I'll zoom in, zoom in a bit more. Just for, yeah, good. Life, friends, is boring. We must not say so. After all, the sky flashes, the great sea yearns, we ourselves flash and yearn, and moreover, my mother told me as a boy repeatedly, ever to confess you're bored means you have no inner resources. I conclude now I have no inner resources because I am heavy bored. Peoples bore me, literature bores me, especially great literature. Henry bores me with his plights and gripes, as bad as Achilles, who loves people and valiant art, which bores me and the tranquil hills and gin look like a drag, and somehow a dog has taken itself and its tail considerably away into mountains or sea or sky, leaving behind me wag. The philosopher um, Andreas Alpidoru dedicated many years of, I'll just close this sum, page because the white light of the page is very unflattering for me. That's, that's better, it's warmer. Um, dedicated a lot of his life to writing about boredom and to trying to describe boredom accurately, the, the anxiousness and lassitude of boredom, the particular qualities. He tried to distinguish it from other states of mind, other emotions. In a state of boredom, he writes, the world is revealed to oneself in particular and indeed striking fashion. The world appears not only to be uninteresting, but also distant, foreign, and often unyielding. Boredom contributes to a loss of value, significance, or meaning. The world of boredom is, in a sense, not our world. It is not the world that is in line with our projects and desires. Our current situation does not attract us. We do not feel compelled to engage with it. The weariness that we experience while bored, compounded with the perception of a slower passage of time, makes the character of boredom 
all the more aversive. Being in a state of boredom feels like being emotionally trapped. But if boredom can be likened to an emotional trap, it is a trap that, due to its own character, fortunately pushes us to escape from it. When I think about it, some kind of exploration of, of boredom or how we deal with, uh, with that tedium, and perhaps these thoughts are particularly on my mind because of the um, inertia of the long lockdown that we've been experiencing in various different ways. A lot of my favorite books gravitate towards that as a subject matter, a kind of radical boredom, the kind of boredom that we're not supposed to admit to, we shouldn't say so, as Berryman says in that poem, because it implies some personal weakness or, or a, a sort of terrible inability to find joy in small significant things in life, um, or a lack of inner resources, as Berryman's mother says in Dream Song 14. Could it be, though, that the emotional trap that Epiduru talks about, the trap of boredom, described in these books is one that is sort of unavoidable and that what we tend to see as success as material gain what we are sort of conditioned to aspire to an idea of a sort of successful worthwhile life that it may be something of an empty promise that it may actually be something rather inevitably boring this led me to think about Joseph Heller's second novel, Joseph Heller, you will know, wrote Catch-22, which is a wonderful comic novel about um, the Vietnam War. Um, my favourite book by him is, is his second, Something Happened, which is narrated by a, a hapless middle-aged man who lives in suburban America with his family and works in life insurance. It's a long novel, it's about 500 pages long, and very little happens until the last 10 pages so it's kind of 490 pages of this guy just talking about how tedious it is working in the job that he works and how he feels the sense of fear of his co-workers the lack of satisfaction he takes in his life on almost every level and for the most part that's what Helen makes it his business to describe that kind of particular trap and cage of boredom and to describe it as accurately as possible this is a quote from quite early in the book the, the narrator is, is sitting in his office before starting work. It's a real problem to decide whether it's more boring to do something boring than to pass along everything boring that comes in to somebody else and then to have nothing to do at all. I frequently feel I'm being taken advantage of merely because I'm asked to do the work I'm paid to do. I have a feeling that someone nearby is soon going to find out something about me will mean the end, although I can't imagine what that something is. This manner of contemplation goes on for several hundred pages and it's actually quite difficult to read at times, but the power of the novel is based on that sheer relentlessness, to use a term my students use a lot, it's relatable, it talks quite honestly about life in ways that we often rather pretend aren't the case, and it's also a deeply sad book, which I think leads to this kind of paraphrase of something B.S. Naipaul said about literature, that the only word a riddle cannot contain is the answer to that same riddle. So a riddle to which the answer is knife can contain any word but the word knife. The answer has to be hidden or occluded or deliberately left out in some way notable by its absence. And in this sense, a lot of novels particularly can be seen as riddles to which the answer is love. They depict a terrifying lovelessness, a kind of dislocation from humanity, which might be solvable, but often isn't within the novel itself. The answer is somehow lying outside of the text in the decisions that the characters didn't take, in the things that for one reason or another, they weren't capable of or weren't open to them in some way. Alexander Schmemann in a sermon in the 1960s said, love is the impossible possibility to see Christ in another person, whoever they are, and whom God in his eternal and mysterious plan has decided to introduce into my life, be it only for a few moments, not as an occasion for a good deed or an exercise in philanthropy, 
but as the beginning of an eternal companionship in God himself. For indeed, what is love, if not that mysterious power, which transcends the accidental and the external in the other, their physical appearance, social rank, ethnic origin, intellectual capacity, and reaches the soul, the unique and uniquely personal root of a human being. I want to return to Eudora, Eudora Welty's initial statement that the voice in literature is trying to speak, but not necessarily trying to comfort. And in its honesty, intensity of imagination and illumination, it may be genuinely consoling. It's definitely something that I turn to literature for, but it isn't trying to comfort necessarily. Cheap thrillers and crime novels are trying to comfort. They're trying to offer us a world where we are only asked to enjoy the spectacle of violence or a very ordered universe where vile things happen, but the perpetrator is quickly caught and punished over the course of 300 pages. It offers us this comforting myth of the monster and the slayer, divorced from any real connection to community or humanity, absolves us of any responsibility to even think about it for very long. It's just solved by the end of the story or the episode. I always feel like it's important to think of contrast to this when I'm being snobbishly dismissive of, of genre fiction. I like a lot of genre fiction as well, and there are plenty of good crime novels, I should add, as a, as a conveyor. But in Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, the, the horrible and brutally described nihilistic crime actually happens within the first 50 pages. The punishment comes much, much later, and most of the novel concerns the way Raskolnikov has separated himself from humanity. That's one of the most striking things about reading that book. He goes about in this state of anxious confusion and dissociation, observing the scenes around him and the people and hearing them, but not really able to partake any longer in a meaningful way in his own life. It's a book about the sheer misery of getting away with something on one level. I'm currently, I'll try to keep this quick, I'll try to sort of wrap this up fairly soon, sorry. It always takes much longer in real life than it does in, in practice, but thank you for bearing with me. Um, I'm currently working on a collection of poetry based around the Book of Jonah, the most reluctant prophet in the Old Testament, and a character who was not permitted to get away with anything. He is called prophecy in a hostile and horrible city and immediately sets off in the complete opposite direction to Nineveh, whereupon he's forced through an increasingly surreal set of divine interve interventions to turn up at the city he was trying to run away from. The moment this is partly the research for this is involving reading some Baruch Spinoza, which I won't try to paraphrase here as it's still slightly going over my head, but proven quite inspiring. That something that I've been really enjoying in the process is the closeness of prophecy to poetry and literature more broadly. And I wouldn't suggest that writers are prophets, the opposite, if anything, but that writers have to have some relation to the prophetic mode, to speaking, as Welty says, not to comfort, which would be propaganda, but to try in however small a way to tell the truth. It's notable for the most part in the Old Testament, prophecy never works. The warning goes unheeded, it's ignored and often mocked. The Book of Lamentations follows the Book of Jeremiah. Jonah is the exception to this, and it's a really bizarre book that I think is really worth rereading, in that we don't actually really get to hear much of a word of the actual prophecy of what he, of what he says, but it is immediately successful. The entire city repents, even the animals um, are dressed in, in sackcloth. Um, the city is ultimately saved. And Jonah is so upset that his prophecy worked, retains such a loathing for the horrible city that he was sent to that he wants to kill himself. He is, he is in a state of absolute despair that his prophecy was successful. Um, I will read one of the finished poems from the, from the sequence and kind of wrap up shortly after that. Um, I'll share screen again. Part of what I'm trying to explore in the book is an idea of how prophecy, if there were any such thing, any longer might, might function now or in the future. Perhaps it is no longer necessary, perhaps we have a sort of fulfillment to that now. Um, this will sound quite weird as an introduction, but it's a poem set in the future um, that imagines certain developments in artificial intelligence and in, intelligence in the presence of, of robots as part of everyday life more so than, than they are now. I wanted to use this kind of science fiction trope and cliche to think about 
sympathy or a kind of performed false compassion, the like of which we're often cornered into expressing through social media and things like that. And the poem kind of explores that on some level through um, an image of a robot who has been programmed to suffer. So it's a poem that doesn't really come to many conclusions, but it's a poem that kind of explores that um, in some way which is reading it. It has two epigraphs, one from the psychoanalyst Gertrudis van der Veer. We know that all vertebrates... Oh, sorry. Yeah. Is the, um, is that, is the screen shared? Is that working? Is this it? It's okay. Like... Yes, it is. That's um, not. That's not. Sorry, I, I couldn't mute the birds, uh, anyone because. Um... No, that's fine. No, no worries at all. No, that's fine. I just, you know, just making sure that I'm on the right screen. I have two monitors, um, and it gets quite confusing. Yeah, um, we know that all vertebrates capable of action have to cope with an initial non-attunement of actions and needs. The reason for this is structural. The second epigraph comes from the Robert Bresson film, The Diary of a Country Priest. Um, which a, an older priest um, advises his, his young curate, a true priest is never loved. We hated to see a robot in a coat, absolutely hated to see a robot shivering and gathering its puffy Olympiad jacket around its beveled metal shoulders as it ambled away from the hospital, insulted something in our hearts, humiliated us even, made us feel sick that we might actually throw up. The robot would explain that he was programmed to feel the cold. What garbage we'd spit at its feet. Had it also been programmed not to correct its own program? How convenient that it should have such a sound excuse when anyone could see that it chose to mock our own frailty the way any demon chooses. So we would trip, I just spat on too fast, sorry. So we would trip the robot by the roadside, its corkscrew arms, its spanner legs bent back. We'd sit on its warm chest, a plate that hummed and glowed in time with our own pulses, then quicker as we roughly pulled off the coat and told it we would bequeath the coat to the truly cold, the truly needy. Yes, yes, I see, the robot said. Of course, there were those who sympathised with the robot, who wept at operas about homelessness. I have nothing to say to such people. I want to conclude on a quotation from the Russian theologian, scientist and martyr Pavel Florensky, and it's, it's one which I find simultaneously challenging, provocative and consoling to anybody who paints, writes or thinks or creates anything in any form at all, really. And it's a quotation that is almost too much for me, slowly too, too rich for me, it feels over ambitious in its spirituality and at the same time speaks about inspiration, a feeling of channeling some idea we didn't know we had in us before we started writing. And in that way, I find it kind of refreshing as well and kind of useful or consoling to return to, even though it goes further than I feel capable of myself. Ferensky wrote, in creating a work of art, the psyche or soul of the artist ascends from the earthly realm into the heavenly. There, free of all images, the soul is fed in contemplation by the essences of the highest realm, knowing the permanent noumena of things. And then satiated with this knowing, it descends again to the earthly realm. And precisely at the boundary between the two worlds, the soul's spiritual knowledge assumes the shapes of symbolic imagery and it is these images that make permanent the work of art. Art is thus materialized dream, separated from the ordinary consciousness of waking life. It's, for me, it's that ordinary consciousness that we so often find ourselves trapped within, as in all of the examples of literary boredom that I've rattled through, the boredom that the urge to create can kind of grow from as if boredom were a sort of fertilizer. And I, I can't claim to have ever visited the, the higher realm that Florensky refers to in his philosophy of creating art, but I do still dimly recognize that act of translation 
that drive to try to express something almost inexpressible, both as an element of faith and as one of art, and that disconnection between the poem, the story, the artwork that we have in our heads and that we set out to write, and what it turns out we're actually capable of doing. It's always something of a compromise, but the job is to try to get as close to the truth of that as possible, even if we can't quite get there. And literature's relation to the truth, I think, is in its relation to that sense of wonder, to the almost impossible work of communication, the impossible possibility of love that Alexander Schmemann mentions, of somehow transfiguring the ordinary, pushing us out of that trap of boredom, the waking life and its somnambulance into something closer to interpreting the visions and the things that confuse us. And if it's true, it's because it speaks to something within us which had perhaps lain dormant up to that encounter. We'll kind of trail off there. Sorry, that was a little bit longer than 20 minutes, but thank you so much for listening. Yeah, th thank you, Luke. And um, yeah, lots of lots of interesting um, ideas and things um, that might provoke thought. Um, so if people do um, have a think about uh, uh, how you might formulate that into a question or a comment, um, that would be that would be really good. Um, and um, I'll, I'll, sorry, but don't worry if not, it's fine. <laughs> you can email me or something. I, I have occasional moments on Zoom where I'm talking and I, I just suddenly have this horrible worry that 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 sort of no one can hear me and and um, and, and sometimes that happens because you're still muted or something. It's yeah. it's it's a strange thing um, about getting used to speaking to people who aren't near you. Anyway, I thought I would open with a question, if that's okay. Um, um, you've spoken, obviously, a lot about boredom. Um, there is a there is there is a sin, um, uh, a cedia, um, that, uh, that comes up in various traditions, which is which is I think very closely uh, related to to boredom, and related to that sense of losing meaning, losing a sense of purpose, uh, losing the sense of good and evil, and and entering into a sort of relativist sort of position. So my question is, if literature directs us towards boredom, are there, are there ways in which it is directing us towards a sense of apathy and meaninglessness? Or is there ways in which boredom can actually reinvigorate meaning and moral purpose? Good, good question, Bru. Thank you. The, yeah, Asidia, uh, that sort of makes me think of the the sort of the original version of of the the seven deadly sins which have been really distorted over time and they were initially in the writings of the desert fathers called the the seven obstacles and they were written specifically to refer to a kind of monastic and ascetic life in in the desert or in a very basic monastery where your most basic needs are being are being met so it's sort of They've been rather, I think, rather cruelly distorted into what we sort of call in sort of popular culture the seven deadly sins. Um, the worst, and there were, I think there were nine of them in the kind of seven obstacles to any sort of spiritual attainment. Um, the worst, far worse than, than gluttony, worse even than, than avarice, much worse than lust, um, was despair, was feeling that you are beyond redemption, was giving up, essentially, was feeling that it's even possible to, to be in a sort of state of absolute perdition where there is no hope anymore so to have completely given up to to to, 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 to fall into a state of, of that utter hopelessness is kind of actually seen as the the worst train of thought when you're kind of contemplating when you're trying to live a life of prayerful contemplation the very worst train of thought is that of, is that of despair is that of the idiot I think um it often is I think a lot of literature functions as a sort of warning I think it's often to sort of say like this this isn't what you think it is this thing, this what, what we what we see as a successful life what we see as love sometimes in some cases often often characters function as kind of warnings of certain kinds of behavior or certain fraudulences or hypocrisies that kind of thing and i think boredom functions in the same way i think it's only by facing it it's only by 
accounting for it accurately and talking about what boredom specifically is that we can sort of attain its opposite in a way that we can engage more fully and readily in life that's not really an answer i think i've sort of lost the second trailed off from the second half of your question Bruce. But. no that that, that that's, helpful. that's helpful um i'm going to switch fire and we're going to bring in Anne. Anne, do you want to ask your question hello yes thank you hello luke thank you Hi. thank you for for coming here this evening it's been fascinating um uh, I didn't know what you were going to talk about, obviously, and that you took this um, turn towards boredom that is really intriguing. Um, and I love the way you say that boredom is the fertilizer. Um, and that, 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 that is, of course, a metaphor. And I wanted to ask you if you could say something about the, the role of metaphor. Um, because it's, you know, there's a lot of metaphor in scripture. And um, perhaps in metaphor the truth is obscured and um, mm. one needs to dig at it in order to interpret it um, yeah. and I just wanted if you, if you could say something about the role of role of metaphor um, in, in that way. Yeah yeah no that's wonderful I really like that the, the, the that is um, a difficult thing about metaphor I think how open to interpretation it is but it's also sort of the the gift of it as well I suppose and the reason the reason that Christ spoke in parables so often that are often followed by a few verses of of the disciples saying what well, what is he saying we don't know what he's saying we don't understand um I think it's sort of I mean it means that it can be like any anything that's open to interpretation it means it can be turned to nefarious ends or sort of or just sort of misinterpreted but again that is something that needs to be discussed there is I suppose a huge tradition of that in interpretations of the the Old Testament in the in the Midrash which I sort of read little elements of when I was researching a book on Cain and on kind of the mark of Cain specifically and there are just thousands of pages of these dialogues between rabbis disagreeing over even what the, the mark specifically was and whether and even on the purpose of the mark whether the mark of Cain was to protect him from people who might track him down as the first murderer and punish him in some way, or whether it was to mark him out so that people would stay away from him, they would sort of explore every different possible angle on it and, and maybe not even really come to an agreement eventually, but just record all of these possible interpretations that they had for people to consult in the future. I think with, with parables, we're meant to sort of struggle with them. We're meant to kind of turn them over in our heads they're perhaps meant to be I think C.S. Lewis says something about this that the same memory in our own lives can look very different at different points in our lives and the same life can look like heaven or hell from different perspectives um, but that I think the same parable can mean different things to us or we can discover different things about it at different points in our life as well and it's that sort of porousness and that applicability that, that gives it a certain lasting power I do also think that it can be I mean, I, I remember as a quite a young, as a kid, really, sort of really vehemently disagreeing with um, the vicar at the, the Baptist church that I was brought up in, um, who gave a sermon on the parable of the prodigal son and, and couched it in terms of, um, we, I suppose in sort of typically evangelical terms, of, of we, we need to bring back the prodigals. We are the, we are the father in this parable, and it's our job to bring back the prodigals who are those people out there, these sort of unruly children outside the church. And I sort of remember even as a sort of 13 year old being quite astounded by this. Because you know, this is, you really, the, the father is God in that story. <laughs> like we are, like we, we are all prodigal, all of us. Everyone, the reason we're in this church is that we're prodigal. The church is a hospital for the soul. This is not kind of, you know, it's probably why I kind of turned away from the church I was raised in eventually. But it's like, I, but then I don't know, it's good. It's good that it's open to that level of disagreement. It's good that it's open to, to that sort of kind of interpretation. But I think when it's, when it's interpreted towards a kind of self-importance, which I felt like that was, I think that that, that, that is worth, querying and worth kind of discussing quite quite robustly and looking at it in context but this is I mean this is quite similar I think in contemporary poetry as as well it, it can be it can be deeply ambiguous the function of metaphor is to try to draw an analogy to try to 
find a likeness in something to try to give people a new way of, of seeing something. It does have, I think, a sort of parabolic function in that way, and in, and in quite a mysterious way, I suppose, and in a way that um, in, in the example of the scriptures that still has some resonance. I mean, a lot of it is based around crops and sort of our farming, so we have to think our way into certain situations to sort of get the hang of them. But something that can still resonate 2000 years later is kind of remarkable as well, the sort of power of these metaphors that still persist. And I think we're always, when we're writing new stuff, always aware of what's gone before as well. They talk about, um, there's a line in um, T.S. Eliot's The Love Song of Delphi Prufrock, the opening line, in fact, that Upton Sinclair identified as the beginning of contemporary metaphor. The poem opens, let us go then, you and I, while the horizon is laid out against the sky like a patient etherized upon a table. And this, for Sinclair, this was such a horribly unusual way of describing a pleasant horizon at dusk. Um, and something so incongruous that perhaps tells us more about the speaker and in what a kind of unsettled state of mind they must be in to look at a horizon and to describe it in that way. Um, that for him, this was the, sort of the beginning of 20th century poetry, of poetry that pushed against metaphor in different ways and did something quite strange and, un and unusual with it. But so there are these, I suppose there are these dual influences and tendencies in poetry at the moment. So this sort of profound desire to be understood and to communicate as clearly as possible and a desire to to say something that is quite strange and porous and open to interpretation this is a really sorry vague and labored answer but <laughs> thank you for the question no thank you very much thank you um just to again change track, um i'll just bring it mike just asks about um uh uh the amount of russian poetry that is happening at the moment and i just wondered um if you had any connections with Russia poetry or um, whether that was something, a connection that you had? I do read, I do read, um, I, the last project that I was working on, I read, um, reread Pushkin's Eugene Onegin, which I really enjoyed, partly just for the sheer, the translation of it, Nabokov's translation of it. I don't actually speak Russian apart from a tiny bit of old church Slavonic. Um, I really love the form of Onegin, the kind of Pushkin version of the sonnet and the sheer um, commitment to that over about 200 poems all in exactly the same form. Um, the obsessiveness of that, I think, I really enjoyed that sort of discipline of it. In terms of, um, I suppose like in a way, this is a question about like poetry and difficulty. You know, like it's about poetry just um, that is so challenging for the reader that it might as well be written in a language that we don't, that we don't speak. Um, and I think there, there is, there can be something quite forbidding about really, really complex stuff about poetry that is written after a, a in, in a sort of metaphysical tradition that is really challenging, that isn't going to be immediately accessible. I guess I just say there are lots of different, there's quite a wide spectrum of poetry at the moment. There's quite a broad collection of different styles and voices you can kind of tune into. A friend of mine, a poet, um, Caroline Bird once said that the thing with, with contemporary poetry is that 97% of it is going to leave you completely cold and you shouldn't worry about that. Just, just move on from it and, and don't worry about it. But 3% of it, you will absolutely love and 3% of it, you would die for. And just keep reading until you find that 3% of it. Just like, and don't, don't feel like you, because there's a lot, there's a lot being published. There's a lot, there's a lot happening and just read for the stuff that you love and don't, don't sort of, worry too much about the stuff that leaves you cold just go that's part of the that's part of the majority of poetry that i just don't get or that just doesn't speak to me <laughs> in some way and there's kind of enough variation i think in style that that you, do, you can you know you can sort of find something often within the same kind of journal that, that does that does resonate with you in some, in some level mm. okay can i bring in john and john do you want to ask um your question john whittaker uh, Luke, thanks for an absolutely awesome talk. It was really interesting. Um, I love that sense of literature being a vehicle for truth, certainly truthfulness. But I guess authors also bring your particular filters with you. So if you're a nationalist, you're going to bring a nationalist filter. Or if you're anti-Semitic, you're going to bring an anti-Semitic filter. Or, um, and, so, and so as readers or consumers of literature, how do we do this discerning? So we, we believe 
that literature can be the vehicle for truth, but it can also be a vehicle for something destructive and life denying. How, yeah. What are the tools we have to discern what is what? Yeah, that's really good. No, I think discernment is the is the word there, right? That we have to. There's, I, get, I suppose I get I get quite angry when when there just seems to be almost this sort of cheerleading for for poetry for kind of like is it poetry some kind of cause that we have to support and get behind that just really irritates me as like, I don't I don't I don't love all poetry what about a I mean how about a poem that specifically insulted me specifically like I would not like that poem I would dislike it I would not see it as something that I wanted to fight for or get arts council funding for like and that, and there's a lot of poetry I think that we just don't like but I think that that, that idea of um filters as well is really vital that writers are going to bring inevitably and we all have our we all have our sort of blinkered spots and we all have our prejudices acknowledged or otherwise and it's an effort I suppose I think it's a constant effort I think in that sense we stay kind of students our entire lives of trying to understand ourselves and each other better there's something in the one of the things i liked about the alexander schlemann sermon that i quoted briefly is the sort of humility in that is that actually we're going to encounter a fairly finite number of people in our in our lives there's something that, that roman term the seculum for that the lifespan and the number of people you meet within that um and that all of that is for a reason in some way and that we don't necessarily we're not necessarily all called to sort of fight for a greater humanity, but we do have a responsibility to the people we actually meet directly and the people we have some influence on and the people we encounter. When, when we're reading, I suppose we just need to stay alive to that fact, stay alive to the potential for nefariousness within it. I think a good writer is somebody who isn't trying to sell you something, I guess. A good writer is somebody who isn't trying to um, convince you of a possibly completely bogus or offensive kind of worldview, I guess, that there's, there is a sort of, perhaps even a sort of statelessness in a way to, 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 that, to that writing that tries to communicate on a more human level. I mean, this is something that comes up in conversations I have with students as well, because quite a lot, there's a lot of, um, in sort of critical theory and sort of literary theory, we, we look at postmodernism and there are a lot of poets who are identified with postmodernism, like um, John Ashbery and Barbara Guest and writers like that, who I love, whose work I absolutely adore, but postmodernism is often misrepresented as this idea that there, there is no truth. There is no, there is no objective truth on which we can converge and on which we can agree. And in a way that is an absolute necessity of a sort of pluralistic perspective of living in a world where we're linked with people who we might completely disagree with, who we, who we, who we have a different religion to, or, or nothing, or you know, or j j just that we have very little in common with. We cannot go around sort of looking down on people or despising people for the differences that we that we have. Um, and at the same time, it can get conveyed into this total relativism where we're just like, there is no longer any morality. There is no longer anything that is that is right, and there is no longer anything that is sort of you know by extension there is no longer anything that, that there is no really such thing as love or anything like that. It's got it can become this just meaninglessness. And I'll, I'll sort of talk to them about the kind of the rise of the or I did like back in sort of 2017, 18, the sort of rise of Trump and the alt right and things like that, and just be like, well, that that this happened in a sort of atmosphere of all pervading irony and comedy and people sort of saying things that were actually quite unpleasant or, or racist but passing it off as a joke or passing it off as irony um there isn't you know there is nothing there is no truth and if, if we can kind of agree that like say fascism is wrong and abhorrent and anti-human then maybe we can also converge around something that is true and right as well if, if there is if the opposite exists then we can at least agree on a very vague sense <laughs> of like how not to be completely horrendous on how not to be inhuman. I think it comes down to that. But it's, yeah, I think it's just, it's only through, I suppose, looking at work on a kind of case by case basis and just knowing that a good writer isn't trying to, isn't, isn't trying to write propaganda, isn't trying to convince you of a particular agenda necessarily. I, and, 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 and noticing it when people seem to be doing that. <laughs> right, well, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Well, okay, one. I'm going to move on if that's okay. Just because um, we've got a couple of questions that it'd be it'd be nice to just have you address, even if briefly. 
Um, but Hilary asks um, basically about how you sort of develop and move students on. You can see a question in the chat, hopefully, um, you know, to a to a more nuanced and more um, uh, honest approach to truth. Uh, do you want to just say something about teaching in that context? Perhaps? Yeah, yeah. I'm reading the question as well. That's great. Which was honesty of truth, which which readers can engage with at a spiritual level towards a human every day. Yeah, yeah. That's um, it's. I think one of the things that makes the job feel worthwhile is is when you you look at the difference between what one of your students is writing in their final year and what they were writing when they first started in their first year and and you by no means take credit for that it's kind of entirely their work <laughs> their kind of commitment to rewriting and editing and reading and studying and and you know you are kind of just a facilitator in that process but when you see how much somebody has improved in in their confidence but also just in their ability to express and explore life and to describe it in this way that feels rich that feels actually engaging and enjoyable to to read even if they are writing about something incredibly small and that's seemingly insignificant that they're able to imbue it with a sense of a sense of meaning but i think I don't know. I think to a certain extent, we still, the study of um, literature as a discipline, there were sort of various professors in the sort of earlier 20th century, like sort of F.R. Levis, whose, whose perspective was that all, the only things we should be studying in terms of novels are the things which are morally instructive. And he had a very small canon of work, which included, included Jane Austen, did not include D.H. Lawrence, who he considered a little bit suspect as a writer and possibly not very morally instructed. He had a very, a very fixed idea of what was actually improving for our minds as, as readers and the stuff that we should be um, engaging with and all the stuff that just we oughtn't to, we oughtn't to because actually they are, it's written by. Um, so he, so he, he, was, he was extremely sort of strict in his views. But I think anything that has been conceived of and, and written just with a, a commitment to a sort of personal truth to talking about direct lived experience accurately and with nuance and without resorting to cliche and without resorting to kind of shop-worn phrases um, and cliche is kind of because cliche is more than just a thing that we're kind of tired of hearing because it's been repeated so much it's a sort of it's a pattern of thought it's a pattern of ultimately it becomes a sort of pattern of life and and and, and we need to resist that and literature is always something that we ought to be able to use to resist that to kind of see through um to something that is more meaningful that is more original that is more communicative than 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 the cliche. I suppose, I suppose cliches can be defined as something that were that were never really that good in the first place, but have been repeated ad nauseum for, for many years. Um, so it's just, it's sort of, it's small things in teaching. You kind of, you really, and you'd have to do it, you have to do it in quite a bespoke way. You have to meet the person you're mentoring, the person who's writing you're, you're, you're looking at. You have to meet them on their own terms, look at what they are actually trying to do and try and help them accordingly. And you don't try and force somebody who wants to write fantasy novels with orcs in to write experimental dub poetry. You just try to help them write a really good story about orcs rather than a rather bad one, <laughs> you know, rather sort of crass one, full of sort of unexamined prejudices. <laughs> you just try to, you just try to, kind of, you try to give them instruction to, to sort of achieve what they want to achieve, I suppose. There has to be that level of respect, I think, and kind of, and, and, and sort of trying to, trying to kind of be excited about the kind of work that they're excited about as well, but just get them to, to do it as well as possible. And you do it through, I think you do do it through just sort of line editing and small things, but as well as just, and just, just talking to them about their ideas and showing them, it tends to work, I think, when it's quite generative as well. I do a lot of writing exercises with my students. We look at a lot of work and kind of do writing in reaction to it. And it's quite often just through working through these, these little, Sometimes just 15 minutes of writing, I'll set them a prompt and get them to write 15 minutes. Sometimes it goes nowhere. Sometimes it doesn't give them anything, but sometimes it gives them just a spark, a particular idea, a metaphor, an image, a character, something that actually becomes like the main character in their first novel or an image that becomes really central to a poem that they write later. And it's those sort of moments of discovery that make it a real 
joy to teach really as a as a as a job it's busy but like, there's a lot of it but it's that's i think it's it's that it's those it's those moments of when somebody almost by accident writes something surprising and beautiful and brilliant and it, and then it's just encouraging to link those moments and to be patient and wait for those moments to to come and link them more and i think through that whatever the story is however even if the story can be quite sort of unpleasant it's that that can be engaging for a reader on a spiritual level really however we interpret the idea of spirituality as well as human and everyday that, that that we often come to literature looking for answers of one kind or another in the same way that we come to spirituality looking for answers of one kind or another sometimes those answers are frustrated i think sometimes the answer is no and that's as true that's as true of reading as it is in prayer i think great um we're getting towards the end um but we have got one more question which i'd like you to answer if, if you can do it in around 60 60 seconds or not too much but it's a good question about whether jane austen's happy endings are truthful <laughs> uh, yeah i think they're sneaky is what i think i think they're sneaky in the way that like Chekhov's short stories are sneaky i think it ends just as things are getting kind of potentially interesting i love jane austen's novels. absolutely adore them um but i think she sort of deliberately ends with certain questions unresolved or a sense of like we don't know exactly what may happen next. I think they're quite they're quite sort of empowering endings in some way. I think often the novels circle around somebody actually finding a sense of defiance and a sense of self, usually her her, her heroines in one way or another, and actually self determining more than they were at the beginning of the novel. I don't know. I'm kind of interested in the way that often in our stories when we write about relationships often the story will end with a wedding or the story will end in a sort of you know in a sort of Bridget Jones kind of way a good underrated novel but also it, it will it, there'll be this sort of happy ending where it's like finally this character has found the love of their life and that's the end everything's fine now and and I think that leads to something untruthful that leads to something unrealistic because actually the majority of our lives are spent after those little tiny events, those little one day things, an actual life, an actual relationship is complicated and is full of things that are actually much more interesting than just leading to this one happy ending, as if it's an ending. It's like it's not, you know, so many stories I think just end at the beginning. And I think that can lead to, I suppose the problem of that untruthfulness is that it can lead to all kinds of weird, weird expectations and sort of, and this strange sort of Thing which feels quite which feels quite normalized in our society of putting more focus on on a wedding than on a relationship itself on one event and on the thing that is to the real life that is to that is to follow i think i mean most weddings i've been to the the sermon has involved really pointing that out and saying that you do realize um but <laughs> yeah, good good clergy will we'll, we'll say things like that i think but but i think just in sort of popular culture and in the kind of narratives that we're often fed things end things end just as just as they're starting and just as the things that actually need to be talked about and need to be said including boredom um really begin to have an effect so i think more i think more books should be written about about long-term relationships rather than the first excitement of, of love in the first couple of weeks <laughs> of meeting something well, that sounds fair enough um <laughs> Well, I've, I've taken two things from this talk. First is your quote that a true priest is never loved, which means yeah. that um, uh, for me and, and for John and if anyone else is, is here from um, the churches in Butney and Roehampton, uh, I, either we're not a true priest or we're not loved, <laughs> both of which seem quite bleak. Um, so thanks, Luke. Something to think about there. For <laughs> it was a very um, tongue-in-cheek epigraph. <laughs> 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 But the other thing um, I, I've taken from this is that uh, fiction, in order to be true, obviously has to relate to life, and um, uh, and that, in, in in the terms you've laid out this evening, seems to suggest that fiction and life are boring, uh, anxious, and unresolved, um, <laughs> which, um, which is uh, again something to think on, perhaps. Um, but thank you. Um, as you can see from the comments, um, 
uh, people. Um, <laughs> so Vienna has just quite rightly pointed out that you preached at our wedding. Um, <laughs> so in terms of pointing out the realities of, of married life, uh, that was your job. Well done. Um, you just asked me because all of his other friends were were priests. So you <laughs> showed favoritism to select from them. So it was very politic to select somebody from the laity to give the service. No, it was beautiful. And you said, because you preached on the fact that you can't miss each other in heaven because obviously, you know, celestial marriage, controversial. And you said something at the end, you said, I hope if it's possible for you to miss each other in heaven that you do and that you live long enough to see your children fall in love. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, Thank you, stay, with us, stay with us, so it's a good sermon, if the one line stays with you then it's done well. We have to wrap up there, um, but thank you again, as you can see from the comments, I, I think people really enjoyed it and found different stimulations, and um, thank you everyone else for joining us as well, and thank you especially for the questions, I know it's awkward and, yeah. and difficult on Zoom, but um, but it, it's good and uh, it's really helpful that we can we can at least have our Lent course this year despite everything else. Um, we will finish with a short prayer. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the truth that your son bore witness to. Help guide us in this Lenten period to a greater sense of truth through study, through caring for one another and acts of service and through prayer. And we ask a blessing on all those who work in the arts at this time and who are struggling and for all students and we pray, pray that you bless us all this evening and all those that we love through Jesus Christ our Lord Amen Thank you again Luke thank you everyone for joining us next week we have Paul um, on truth in politics from a think tank and um, yeah yeah, that will be a very different sort of talk, but do join us again for that and um, have a very good evening and uh, blessed and holy Lent. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.